Good morning. My name is Mike Bryan. I'm working as a volunteer at the Southern Arizona uh, VA in Tucson, Arizona. Uh, today is Friday, September 27th, <laughs> and uh, TGIF for everybody. Yeah. And we're here to, today to uh, interview Harold Don, who uh, was with the uh, Marine Corps in Korea, uh, specifically up in the Frozen Chosen area, I understand. And yes. We're here to get Don's story. So if, uh, if you would, just give me your full name and uh, your birthday. Uh, my name's Harold Don. I was born in Casa Grande, Arizona, uh, January 12th, 1931. My parents came over from China, or oh, I guess maybe about eight or ten years earlier, landed in San Francisco, where my sister was born. She's the oldest, and I'm the second oldest, and the uh, first son. And uh, after after a year in Cass Grand, uh, let me back up. My my grand grandfather came over from China and established a, a store in Cass Grand. With the three brothers, the oldest brother took over the business in Cass Grand, and the two younger brothers, who were twins, moved to Tucson because there wasn't enough business in one store to support the three families at the time. The families lived always lived in the back of the store. So my dad came down to Tucson, established a, a store here in Tucson, first by peddling, peddling uh, vegetables and, and uh, produce uh, around the uh, west part of the Tucson. Back then it was all dirt roads, and it was called the Hollywood Barrio at the time. And from that, he, he managed to scrape up enough money to, to rent a, a, a building and then establish a, a grocery store. And uh, it wasn't until maybe about four or five years later, he saved up enough money to buy a piece of property right by the uh, river. It was just a block down from where he, where he, he started his business. And built a, a grocery store there. And that's where uh, I grew up. What's, what's, what started the migration? The migration? You know, well, your grandfather and his brothers, I mean, why did, why well, did? Well, from what my mother used to tell me is, America was, the Chinese used to call it the uh, Gemsan, which meant uh, Gold Mountain. And I guess back then people living in China were so darn poor that anything, <laughs> anything, uh, uh, that would tempt them to come over for a better life. Yeah, for a better life. And so they did come. And that's how they, they uh, eventually got started in, in Tucson. Okay. And so I lived there for the better part of all my life uh, up until the we sold the place in uh, 1990, I believe it was, after my parents had passed away. Mm -hmm. um, so they came over just a few years then before the start of the war? The uh, World War II. Two. No, they, they were here way back. Uh, let's see. About the 1920s, I would believe. Okay. That was your parents? My parents, my, yeah, my father. And your parents. Okay. Well, actually, my father, and then after my, my father had got established, he went back to China and married my mother and brought her over mm -hmm. in about the 1926, 28, something like that. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and after I was born in Cass Grand, uh, we moved down to Tucson, and I lived in Tucson all my life. So I'm a native, more or less a native Tucson, mm -hmm. or native Arizona. You don't meet many native Tucsonans. <laughs> <laughs> no, not really. Everybody's from somewhere else. Yeah. Uh -huh. And uh, the neighborhood that we lived in was called the Hollywood Barrio. I don't remember what the story was on that. 
I guess it's because a lot of the guys that lived in the neighborhood used to wear sunglasses. Oh. So they got to give the name Hollywood, I guess. <laughs> and uh, so from that, we went to school at Menlo Park there, which was uh, a couple of blocks from the house there. And then we went to uh, Roskridge Junior High School, and then to Tucson High School, which was the only high school that in Tucson at the time, other than that theater, which was a Class B school. Mm -hmm. And that's where I, in Roskridge and, and high schools, where I met the majority of my classmates who were in the Marine Corps with me. We, uh, somehow we all uh, joined the Marine Reserves back, back in high school. Was this, before, this was before the war started? Right, before Korea. Before. Yeah, this was like right after World War II. Yeah. yeah. And, uh, well, most of the kids going to high school at the time were so poor that they, they joined the Marine Corps uh, Reserves to get that $2, I think it was $2.50 a meeting once, once or twice a month, I can't remember now. And then uh, all the, the Marine clothing that they issued which we uh, which we wore to school, <laughs> the green T-shirts, <laughs> and uh, and in I graduated in 1949, 1950, when the Korean War broke out. They called it the uh, reserves, and uh, there was I guess about 250 of us that were in the reserves at the time, and the reserve center was on on. Uh, 22nd Street and, and Albernon. Hmm. Okay. And uh, what was your impression of the Marine Corps, you know, coming out of World War II and then that that short lull in between mm -hmm. World War II and Korea? Did you did you have an impression of what the Marine Corps was like? Well, I used to be watching a lot of those John Wayne movies <laughs> <laughs> during World War II, yeah. and that sort of sold me on the Marine Corps. You know, being a Marine, wanting to be a Marine. Actually, I wanted to be an an, uh, an aviator, flying fighter planes, but I was too short, wore glasses, so I couldn't. <laughs> I knew I wouldn't qualify, so yeah. so that was like my second best choice. So who, you, who all joined in the reserves then? You said well, that. most of the kids from high school that went to high school, ju through junior high and high school with me joined up. And uh, at the time we were called in, I think there was something like about close to 240, 250 uh, guys that were in the uh, reserve. And of course there were a few World War II veterans that were in the reserves at the time too, just to keep up their their um, eligibility, I guess, of, mm -hmm. as a, with the military. And so we were called up in June, left for Camp Pendleton in July. This was in 1950. 1950, right? Okay. And then in August, uh, well, we were once we got to Camp Pendleton, we were all reassigned to different units. Mm -hmm. We didn't stay together as a unit. And there were other other reserve units coming in from all over the country too. Mm -hmm. So it's like uh, we were reassigned to different units with different different uh, reservists from other areas of the country. So what did you do during that month at Camp Pendleton? Mostly uh, just uh, training, depending on what what your MOS was. Your and uh, infantry training, basic infantry training. Mm -hmm. The Marine Corps, every, every Marine's a, basically is an infantryman. And so whether you were, were uh, uh, headquarters or not, you, you learned to shoot a rifle, you know. So after we were assigned to Camp Pendleton, we uh, left for Korea. I believe it was August the 17th, 15th or 17th or something like that. And if I remember correctly, it took us like 17 days aboard ship to get to Korea. So <laughs> it, was, it was a long haul. <laughs> and not a pleasant trip, you know. And uh, aboard ship, of course, we were uh, 
they were training us to condition us. You know, we were doing exercises and stuff like that, and, and field strip our rifles and machine guns and whatnot, and fire, fire um, over, out into the ocean to get used to the firing, use the rifles and machine guns. What was the mood like then amongst the guys? I mean, were they? Well, I think some, some, some of the guys were sort of scared, and I wasn't particularly scared. I was didn't know what <laughs> what we were headed into, you know. So uh, I, I guess overall they they, they didn't want to expect mm -hmm. as far as what we were going to be used for, you know. Yeah. So and we didn't. Most of it never even heard of Korea. We didn't even know where Korea was at the time. We knew it was about the, uh, like China and Japan there somewhere, but exactly where we didn't know. I mean, at least I didn't. Yeah. So, what was when you got there? What what was like the first couple of days like in Korea? Yeah. When we, uh, I believe, well, after we disembarked, we were up at like three, four o'clock in the morning with all our gears ready to go. And we, I guess the earlier waves disembarked earlier, but uh, we were like in the, I believe it was the 14th, 15th wave or something going in, so we, we didn't disembark until later that morning. And you could see the different waves going in. And uh, prior to that, I guess the Navy had bombarded the area two or three days in a row, you know. Now, where did you yeah. land at? In Incheon. At Incheon? Yes. Okay, so the war had already, had already the North Koreans had already attacked and had right. pushed the UN forces south. Down to Pusan, Maison perimeter there. Right. So, the, so Incheon was over on the west coast. Yes, on the west coast. Yeah, mm -hmm. so that was really the first Assault, assault that that the U.S. made to try to retake right North Korea, so. and I guess the idea was to cut cut off cut off the North Koreans as they as they because uh, I guess that was part of their supply route mm -hmm. going south. Mm -hmm. Was I guess the idea was to cut off their supply route, and so we made the Incheon landing, and then within. Uh, Four or five days we took Seoul, I guess it was. What was, what was. What was the fighting like? It was, uh, it was, uh, I guess for certain units it was it was pretty heavy. Other units weren't, weren't hit as hard. And our, our, our particular unit uh, wasn't hit that hard until we got to Yangdong Po. And we ran. It's it's a uh, there was a river there that runs through through uh, just before Seoul there Yangdong Po, and there's, there's like a river, a uh, highway was built up along these the road there where we were dug in at that night, and we got we got hit pretty heavy that night. We, and, we heard tanks coming through, and they were North Korean tanks. At first, we didn't know what, what they were. We thought maybe they were our tanks, but it turned out they were North Korean tanks going north. And that morning, we heard some more tanks rumbling through the village there. And we all jumped in our foxholes thinking they were more North Korean tanks, and they, as it turns out, they was our, our, our tanks that uh, came through that morning. So they were pushing the North Koreans yes. back up north yes. at that point. Right. And then from uh, Yangdong Po, we went into Seoul. Seoul was all bombed out. I mean, the city was really flattened out. There was nothing but ruins there. And uh, then we took over Seoul. And then after, after that, we came back and boarded ship again and rounded the, the peninsula heading on the east side of the peninsula, going up north, and I guess the uh, the plan was to make a landing at uh, at uh, 
we landed at Warrenstein, but we couldn't land right away because we spent about two or three days just going back and forth on the sea there until they cleared the harbor of, uh, of uh, mines. Mines. Yeah, line, not mine, line, but the uh, depth, what's it called? Well, mines. Mine. Yeah. yeah. Give the minesweepers a chance to get in and clean all Yeah, right. Mm -hmm. yeah. But by the time we landed, the South Korean sugar had already <laughs> entered the the uh, Wonsan, and so we didn't uh, we didn't have to fight another battle there or make another landing there. And then from there, we headed up towards uh, towards the Chosin Reservoir. That's pretty close up to the Chinese border then, right? I think it, it, it was something like about 75 miles from the Chinese border. Yeah. But uh, they, uh, I think that some of the uh, civilians had reported that there were Chinese troops massed along the border there. Mm -hmm. And, uh, but they, you know, for sure, and if they did, they didn't think they were going to invade uh, North Korea. So we we went ahead and we were to go ahead and and, uh, and take the uh, area around the Chosin Reservoir there and then head on towards the Yellow River, I guess, the Chinese border after we took that. But then the Chinese intervened when we were, when the uh, Marines were at uh, at the Chosin Reservoir. Is that where you were at? Yes, sir. Uh, uh, and uh, the 7th Marines were the, were the unit that was furthest ahead. And the 5th, and then maybe one, one battalion of the 1st Marines. And we were more or less like uh, in, in reserve. But uh, the day that the Chinese hit in full force, we were supposed to move up to relieve, relieve the Seventh Marines at the point. At the point, and I guess that that was to me that was it was lucky that we didn't because I, otherwise we'd have gotten the front of the uh, and the Seventh Marines and Fifth Marines lost quite a few few people up there. Then, uh, well, we had to fight our, our way out of the reservoir there. So the reservoir was, was that, it was a man-made reservoir it, for drinking water and that kind of thing? I guess it was a man-made reservoir, I'm not sure now that. Yeah. I think there was a dam there. And uh, for electric power, I guess that was part, part, part of their source of electric power in North Korea. Mm -hmm. Well, when the, China, when the Chinese started into the when they engaged in, in the war and mm -hmm. it took it took a turn so it, it must have been a pretty awesome wave of people coming at you. Well there was something like about a hundred over a hundred twenty ten twenty thousand Chinese troops up there that came into the into the war at the Chosen Rizal. Mm -hmm. So what what do you what do you remember about your involvement in your activities, so when you find out? Uh, we were coming up from the south. We had landed to further south, and uh, at uh, Wonsan. And then we, from Wonsan, we, we spent a couple nights in the, in the area there fighting guerrillas. And uh, gradually made our way towards the Chosin Reservoir. When you say fighting guerrillas, what? Well, North Koreans, I guess. North North Koreans. Koreans. Okay. And they, they were more or less like guerrillas, guerrilla tactic type of. A, it wasn't an organized no, front, right? Yeah, all kind of a thing. Yeah, little, yeah, little groups here and there that were hitting our lines. You know, nothing in full force, mm -hmm. like a, a an attack or anything like that. And then uh, from there, that's when the uh, Chinese moved into the, the uh, 
Chilson Reservoir and tried to, well, they were trying, I, from what I've read, they were trying to not annihilate the Marine, first Marine Division, cut us off, and then uh, eventually annihilate the first Marine Division. Well, you all were pretty far advanced up along that eastern coast. Yes. So it seems like it would have been pretty easy to get in behind you guys and to, ice, and to cut you off. Oh, yes, right. And well, we were surrounded. I mean, uh, there's no... They were in the mountains all around the reservoir there. Yeah. And on the east side was an army unit that got hit real hard. And uh, they were trying to withdraw back down the, the uh, east side of the, the uh, reservoir and they got hit real hard and were, were overrun and a lot of the wounded that were on the trucks were all killed and burned and, but uh, some of them did manage to escape and and by then the lake had frozen over and some of the the, the uh, Army units that were were wounded and trying to uh, withdraw from the, were, were overrun by the Chinese and uh, quite a few of the army people uh, crossed the lake, the frozen lake, to get the marine lines. Mm -hmm. So he was frozen enough that they could yeah, right. like, walk on it, or could they drive their trucks? Trucks on it or uh, jeeps maybe, but jeeps, I, I don't. Yeah. I don't think they tried to drive the heavy trucks. Yeah. But uh, so you were on the west side then of the reservoir. Uh, yes, I'm on. Okay. Right, so they're coming over to join you guys and try to. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. And uh, so you're surrounded, and you've got this wave of people trying to kill you. Yeah. And of course we had to fire our way out. And it's in Marine Corps history is one of the epic battles of the Marine Corps mm -hmm. because of all the uh, the uh, troops that were were surrounded by by supposedly 120,000 Chinese troops and. Uh, At the end of the battle, which lasted up probably about almost two weeks here, there there were something like about 17 Medal of Honor given out, 70 somewhat Navy crosses given up for the second highest award, and uh, Silver Stars, There's a lot of Marine Rhyme Marine Stars, Marine yeah. Stars. So. It's uh, it's gone down in Marine Corps history, one of the epic battles of the Marine Corps. So what were, what were you trying to do? Obviously, get out of there. So we're we're, we're, we're I'm assuming. Well, yeah, we were trying to fight our way out. You know, and where to? Back down the road. The uh, they called the main MSR, the main supply supply route. It was the only mountain road that went up through. North Korea to the Chinese border, and of course we had to maintain that, that road open in order for all the troops to get back out through there. Mm -hmm. They had to come down through that one road, and that was it. So you got one basically dirt road, yeah, to, to uh, hold, hold open so that uh, everybody could retreat back through that road. How long? How long of a trip would that have been? I guess it was something about. I'm not sure, about 40, 50 miles, something like that, probably. Mm -hmm. Back to the port, seaport. Oh, it was, a, it was going yeah, it was south, back over to the coastline. To the coastline, yeah. Okay, okay. To where we, we, we uh, evacuated from, from that seaport there. And also, not only that, but there was like about a, from what I read, about 100,000 uh, North Korean civilians that uh, that follow us down the road to the seaport in order to escape from the Chinese. <laughs> they, they feared the Chinese, so they they uh, 
they evacuated with us there. They had something like about 100,000 of them evacuated, that uh, the U.S. evacuated from, from uh, the seaport there. And they came back south with, with the North Koreans. Uh, North Korean civilians, yes. Uh, okay. and, uh, that was a pretty cold winter, too. Like yes, it was. was. Very cool. They said it was historic, I guess. Uh, it was so cool that, uh, well, we couldn't dig a, really dig a foxhole because the ground was so hard, frozen hard. We'd just scoop out the snow and make an indentation in the ground there and just lay, lay an indentation like that. And in some cases, throw the snow back over us to keep help, help keep, to keep us warm. And uh, Tucson probably sounded pretty good at that oh, point. Oh, yeah, it sure did, yeah. <laughs> so I'd get in my... I'd get my sleeping bag today, all my winter gear on, my snowpack and everything else. And of course, I never zip them, never zip my sleeping bag up. I always left my M1 right on top of me, it's pointing to pointing out like I was obeying it. There was one Tucson uh, Tucson reserves with another company up there that, that was bayonet in the sleeping bag, and he's one of the twelve. He was one of the 12 or 13 Tucson, Tucson Marines that were, were killed up at the wall in Korea. But he was one of the ones that was killed in, at the reservoir there. And he was being at it in his sleep. Yeah, bag. right. So and after that, you never zipped it up again? <laughs> no. <laughs> I always slept my sleeping bag open. <laughs> and uh, one of the other Tucson boys was missing in action, so I don't, I don't think they ever found his body. But uh, there's a uh, uh, area set out at Kino Memorial Park, I guess they call it, mm -hmm. with the pictures of the 13 from Tucson that, that were killed in Korea. Yeah, that's where the Korean yeah. Memorial was at. Yeah. So what, what were nights like during that two weeks? Period. What were the nights? What, what, did you all try to position yourself, or did you try to keep moving, or what? what, what uh, no, we used to dug in at night. Okay. We'd, uh, we'd uh, the officers would form a perimeter around them, with a, maybe like a mountain top, and then we'd all dig in. Mm -hmm. Each had foxholes. Uh, it's usually two, two, uh, two men to a foxhole, maybe about five or ten yards apart, depending on the terrain and whatnot. Mm -hmm. In real steep terrain, we probably wouldn't have as many foxholes. But in area where it was more level, where it was easier for them to attack, we'd have more foxholes and more men. And normally, the machine guns, the heavy machine guns, the water cooled machine guns, would always be put that on a the most vulnerable point, mm -hmm. and that's where we, we, we dug in the most vulnerable point. Were you all one of the heavy machine guns? The water cooled machine guns, yes. Mm -hmm. but that, that was a term they called the, the uh, water cooled machine guns back then. They don't have them anymore, but back in, in Korea they had I'm, I'm not sure whether they used them in Vietnam or not. I don't think so. I think Korea was the last... Mm -hmm. last uh, in Vietnam we had the M60. Yeah. yeah. So uh, Korea was the last place that they used the water cooled machine guns. Wouldn't that water freeze up? Well, we use antifreeze. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. We replaced the water with antifreeze. And it would warm up pretty Well, well you know, it would keep, the, keep the, uh, you know, the barrels from freezing. You know. so, so the some of the people that you were serving with, when you, do you, do you remember any particular individuals better than others? or? You know, friends uh, that, that you kind of bonded we, with. We still have a group here in Tucson that were in the reserves, the, the reserve unit that left for Tucson. The, the last Thursday or every month we have a luncheon at that L&L uh, Mexican driving uh, restaurant there. Mm -hmm. And normally we have anywhere from seven or eight guys to about oh, 14 or 15 guys every month we get together and just enjoy each other's company and go over sea story and uh, re re fight the war. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah.
I see where you had a, a letter of commendation with a combat. Um, yeah, I got that at the uh, at the reservoir, Chilson Reservoir. Uh, we were dug in. Our our machine gun was dug in at the on the road, and uh, one one day, uh, one night, one evening, the lieutenant came back came by and asked for volunteers to take supplies up to the up the mountain through no man's land at night to resupply the uh, the uh, the platoons that were on the mountain there. So I volunteered knowing that there were some Tucson guys up in the mountains, so mm -hmm. that's, that's the reason I volunteered. And so we uh, called up supplies, water, ammo, food, uh, sea rations, uh, through the mountains there to the, to the, to the uh, it was Able Company then, the Able Company lines dropped off the food there and I can't remember whether we brought back several wound, wounded wounds with us or not. But anyway, uh, that was what the, that letter of commendation was for. To take that take all night? To, to uh, mostly, yeah. It took a, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I think we didn't get back until about 3 or 4 o'clock that morning. Did you run into anything on the way? No. no. It was. For one thing, So you were you, you got a Purple Heart? No, I didn't. Huh? No, not for frostbite. <laughs> not for frostbite. <laughs> <laughs> I think the closest I came to getting a Purple Heart was uh, at Horseshoe Ridge. There, uh, we were we were withdrawn because we, we were surrounded, by, and we were our machine gun unit was dug in the in back of the mountain with the uh, tanks. Of course, the tanks were shooting all night, fire, firing all night long. And next morning, of course, the half the force was blown, blown, blown down from all the shooting. Mm -hmm. And they were evacuating the uh, wounded in the from the backside of the mountain there through, with a helicopter. And uh, at one particular time, uh, I, I was watching the helicopter go, and and it it got hit, and it. But the pilot was able to land, land the helicopter, and took off the wounded and put through the wounded on us on a truck, some of those six black trucks, and uh, and the pilot had well they blew up the helicopter and left the helicopter there to blew it up, and the pilot had to walk out with us. They gave him one rifle. He had to walk out with us, <laughs> and uh, it wasn't until later. We were talking about that, and, and Gilbert Romero. Mm -hmm. Have you talked to Gilbert Romero? I will this afternoon. Oh, okay. Yeah. He was on that helicopter, and I didn't know it at the time. And so they took him off, and the other wounded Marine put them on a truck. Mm -hmm. And on the way down, he got hit again in the leg, saw the truck. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, one of one of our Tucson Marines was a corpsman. And he he had uh, I guess back at Battalion uh, CP there, uh, aid, the Battalion Aid Station. I guess he he uh, recognized who he was, and he didn't think he was going to his he, his jaw. He got hit in the jaw with a bullet, and I guess it ricocheted through his shoulder or something. But anyway, he thought he was he was didn't think he was going to make it the way he looked then. So he gave him his, his rosary. I mean, Beats, I guess, and he read him his last rites. Mm -hmm. And uh, Gilbert likes to tell a story where, where they put an aim on his forehead, and it was for morphine. <laughs> and he, he says, "I thought that aim was for me uh, Mexican." <laughs> 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 that guy's really. Uh, <laughs> that's one thing about her. We're always joking around, you know. <laughs> That's how you get through those kinds of things. Yeah, right. right. Yeah. So it, it, we're close knit group. We, we enjoy getting together like that once, once every month, and mm -hmm. retell all our sea stories and whatnot. Of course, each time we tell them, it gets bigger and bigger. And you, and you get better and better. <laughs> right, better and better. Right. <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> well, did did anybody uh, 
make any observations about, you know, the, the, you had these attacking Chinese and you were of Chinese descent. Was well, that ever an issue or a conversation? Or? No, the only issue was a couple of times there was another uh, Chinese guy in our unit. He was with the mortars, I think 81 mortars. And his name was uh, Richard. Richard Sung. Richard Sung. Did you ever watch the uh, series uh, Mash? Mm -hmm. He appeared in that several times. Mash, and then, and then I, I was watching a uh, a uh, Western series here, how the West was won, and it shows this guy. And this was about Chinese immigrants working on the railroad, building the railroads, you know. Mm -hmm. And this one scene that shows this guy standing by a tree there. And it, I mean, it's right, right up close shot. And I said, I know that guy. That's Richard Sun. <laughs> and it was him, because <laughs> after after the movie, they list all the characters, you know. Yeah, Sentinel. He was a Sentinel, Chinese Sentinel. Richard Sun, I'm done. Oh, <laughs> so, yeah. And uh, he was trying to get us to uh, uh, have a reunion in Los Angeles, I guess, or somewhere. Uh, and he was trying to get the all the MASH characters to uh, to appear as guests, you know, for all the, the reunion. Mm -hmm. And I, he says they, they they turned him down because it wasn't it wasn't their idea. <laughs> because he 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 uh, he uh, suggested the idea. They they turned it down. He says otherwise, if somebody else had thought of it, they would have probably gone ahead with it. Mm -hmm. So they didn't uh, didn't do it. We all took pretty heavy casualties during that, that two, two week. Of course, the Marines don't call that a retreat, do they? No, we were just fighting a different direction. <laughs> Which we were. <laughs> we had to fight our way out of there. We weren't retreating. We were just had to fight our way out of there. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, they lost a lot of guys up there, I think. I can't remember what the casualty was. was seven, over 750 Marines or something killed. And uh, out of I, uh, what, what was the total number of Marines that were up I think there? Something like about 1,500. 1,500? 1500? Yeah. yeah. No, 15,000. Against 120,000. Yeah. And uh, so you so you finally get back to the port then. Yes. Was it, was there a point during that two weeks when you realized that you'd made it? Uh, well, we knew we made it out after we were, the last tanks came back through that that uh, that road that was uh, that bridge that was bombed out. Mm -hmm. Just before the tanks came through, well, we, we we our unit, which was on the road, took off before them, ahead of them, mm -hmm. and we boarded trucks and then had the truck brought us back down to the seaport. Yeah, you know, with the tanks falling, mm -hmm. okay. that's a very good argument. What was the, what was the sense then? The relief? Uh -oh. <laughs> it was, it was great. <laughs> <laughs> to know that we were, you know, finally going into a safe zone. Yeah. Because from there on, I think the arm, it was an army unit up there that had, it was uh, in charge of that one area there around the seaport, so. And in fact, in fact, we stopped they stopped our convoy as we got towards towards the seaport there, and they took away the, they took away a couple of jeeps in the truck from the Marines that had picked up that the army had dis, you know the army had uh, had uh, abandoned up there. The Marines oh, took yeah. them over, yeah. <laughs> and, they they, took them <laughs> and they stopped the convoy. And they took the jeeps and the uh, and the truck away from the Marines. <laughs> <laughs> So we, we can use them now. <laughs> yeah. Thanks for bringing them down for us. <laughs> uh, but, uh, so how much how much time did you have to relax and like that? Because you, there was still, the, I mean, I, 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 you know, I can't. I think it was just a day or two, and then we boarded the ship. The, the mm -hmm. brought us back down to South Korea. There, we weren't there too long. Because the Chinese were still invading in, in, in yeah. the U.S. and you guys were moving south. Still. Once, once we got there, we were, we were assigned, I 
don't think we stayed overnight out in the uh, out in the area there. I think they assigned us to that. Uh, uh, I think it was a Red Cross ship or a hospital ship. Okay. And we were at our our unit was where it was in the dental office. <laughs> so you guys can think on dental chairs there. We were the rest of us were on the floor sleeping. <laughs> And Probably felt yeah, pretty good though. Yeah, yeah, that's how crowded it was. I mean, that, that ship was just jam packed with, with uh, Marines. And then we left left uh, left the port there, I guess, the next day or the day after or something like that. And if that was hot chow, yeah, for, for once we had, had hot chow, we hadn't had for about three or four weeks. Yeah. And you got your frostbite taken care of and everything there? Uh, no, not really. We, we just uh, learned to live with, you know, it took my and told us a while to turn pink again. You know, they were sort of, sort of purple looking for quite a while there. And I was lucky that I didn't lose any toes and or fingers and good. So, but then when I came to the VA later on, you know, I learned to live with. I didn't have a lot of problems with my fingers, and toes, uh, until. I started getting older around 60 years old and I came to the VA to see if I could get some sort of a, of a medical treatment or, or care for And they, they said, oh, you're just getting old, that's all. It's just from old age. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> you know, <laughs> they didn't know anything about frost back then until I, more and more Marines start showing up with you know, symptoms of frostbite. After you know, after so many years, it, really, it damages your nerve endings, I guess. From mm -hmm. and uh, so they finally it, realized. It just, so they just finally realized. Well, maybe there is something to it. So they start checking into it, and, and then I guess it's ninety-eight that they they finally passed a bill that uh, they were accepting veterans for frostbite, and then even then after. After that, it took them about two years to, to learn to what, to, you know, what, what to look for as, as far as symptoms went, you know. What are, yeah. what are the symptoms? Yeah. Well, like, like you lose feeling. Like my no, my feet are always feel like they're numb, you know. Mm -hmm. And when, when, when you're numb, they're numb like that, you, you can't, sometimes you can't. Uh, so sometimes when I walk, I sort of wobble around right after I have set this been sitting for a long time or staying for a long time because I don't have any feeling there in there. So, yeah, so balance becomes a yeah. issue. Mm -hmm. yeah. And uh, you know, of course my hands are they're always aching. So were you then, when you got on the hospital ship then, were you redeployed somewhere else in Korea or what? Uh, no, we came back down south and then from there we uh, started up the central and eastern Korea. So you were redeployed then? Redeployed, in, yeah, in the yeah. central, central and eastern Korea. Okay. And uh, that's where we did most of our, our fighting till I, I left in August, so... And uh, as I recall, I think we were up there by the Huachang Reservoir. Or even, even up a little further, maybe. Because that was the other phase, because the Chinese, I guess, pushed south. Quite yeah, and I, I didn't know at the time, I didn't know they, they retook Seoul. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I said, what? <laughs> I, of course, I didn't know about it until after I read about it. I, I didn't know at the time. Yeah. Let's see, after all that, they, they retook Seoul again. But then, but then, then the I course, gradually, yeah. yeah, and then gradually they, they, But that was, there was heavy fighting there. When, when the Chinese were, were in Korea, in South Korea there. And, and they had pushed, I guess, the UN troops back back down. And the, then I guess the UN troops had a, another spring offensive or something to take, retake some of the land that they had, they had uh, Chinese had retaken mm -hmm. up towards the uh, 38th parallel, I guess it was. So were you involved yeah. in, in that? Up to, until August, yeah. Up until August. Yeah. 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 So were you still on the machine gun or did you have different duties? Yeah, I was a machine gun squad leader at the time, but then 
has made his plot here, ran out of sergeants, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> so they promoted him to the sergeant, maybe a sergeant. I guess that was around April, May. Well, and so I was, I was the uh, uh, squad leader. So by then you'd been in country how long? Uh, by the time I left, it was 11 months. 11 months. Combat, most of the combat time. Yeah. Yeah. We what, what? Every now and then we, our units would be relieved for R&R. &R. Our R&R &R was like about five or ten miles behind the front lines. <laughs> <laughs> hot yeah. shower and hot food <laughs> for about three or four days and then send us back up the line. <laughs> and knowing that there would be no incoming. <laughs> Not like the Army. You know, they got to go back to Japan, rest for a couple of weeks and then go back. So what do, you, what do you remember most about those uh, 11 months? About what? Those 11 months in the country. What do I remember most? Uh, I guess the country itself. The uh, It was sort of a third world country. You know, they were backwards in a lot of, a lot of ways. They, the uh, I guess the only modern city was Seoul, and that was all brought about. Mm -hmm. But all the little villages that we went through, they are still using uh, old methods, you know, to farm and live and they lived in those little uh, mud, mud buildings with a straw mm -hmm. roof, you know, the thatch. Yeah, and then they, uh, their uh, uh, cesspools were just like a little, little hut with a couple of cunts running across it, going there squatting through their business, and, and then they use that to, to irrigate their fields with, you know, the yeah. and fertilizer. Yeah, fertilizer. Yeah, fertilizer. Yeah. It's, it had a, it had a, a sewer smell all, everywhere you went. Yeah. You know, it had that sewer smell. That's something you got used to after a while. There's such a thing as getting used to something. <laughs> so, so the country itself is, is what you. Mean? I think it was it was mostly mountainous, and uh, mostly green. Uh, it's a beautiful country. If you're talk, just talking about the countryside itself, yeah. but mostly mountainous, from what I remember. Every hill we went with it was mountainous. And, Trees. You didn't have much time to really appreciate all of that, no. though, at the time. No, not really. No. <clears throat> Are there guys or leadership, you know, the, you know, commanders or, you know, folks like that that come to mind, or...? You mean the Marines? Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. Uh, that's one thing I, I, I really got it from it is that, uh, uh, you read about uh, all these Marine uh, commanders, and I got to meet and see the majority of them at our reunions. And uh, our company commander, the house of the first, there's three machine gun units, first, second, and third machine gun. And uh, we were, I was with the first machine gun unit, and we were usually assigned to Able Company. Mm -hmm. And the second was uh, Baker, and then the third was Charlie Company. Well, Able Company at the time, Captain Barrows was the CEO of Able Company. Turns out later on he becomes Commandant of the Marine Corps. Seriously. <laughs> and he came to Tucson for Able Company reunion. I forgot what year it was, 19-something. And he met with all of us, of us here in Tucson, and with all the Able Company, from other guys from Able Company coming from all over the country. Yeah. And so that, that was something. And with him at the time was uh, General Johnston, I don't know if you know him or not. Mm -hmm. Well, anyway, G General Johnston, was general marine general in charge of Desert Storm Marines, and at the time he was uh, after that he, he was uh, General Barrel's uh, sidekick, whatever you call him, mm -hmm. aide or yeah. 
and he, he was here with Tucson with uh, General Burroughs. And uh, it's funny, then you know, we were, we're all in a meeting room there, and he comes up and introduces himself. I'm Bob Johnson, you know. Oh, I'm glad to meet you. Sir. And I looked at him and said, how do you fit in? I said, you look too young to be one of us. <laughs> here I'm calling you general, you know. <laughs> I didn't know he was general at the time because he just didn't introduce himself as Bob Johnson. <laughs> Oh, okay, sir. <laughs> yes, sir. General Bob. <laughs> that, was, that was sort of funny. <laughs> uh, so the reunions are, are pretty common then, it sounds Well, like. yeah, it's, uh, they're talking about the, this may be, no, I don't know if they, but they were, they were talking a couple years ago, it, it, maybe they'd only had one or two more, and that was it, because you know, our numbers are getting fewer and fewer. Yeah. We're all in our 80s, you know, and 80s and nothing. Pushing 90, and so the next one's going to be at Nashville, Tennessee, and uh, I made it a point we're going to make that one because my my grandson and my uh, son-in-law live in Chattanooga, Tennessee. Oh, okay. So it's a kill two birds with one stone to go to the reunion and have them pick me up and go visit with them for about a week. Are there things? that you still value that you learned during that experience in Korea? Well, I learned to appreciate life more. I, I, it was a good experience, uh, you know, in, in, in the fact that I made it out okay without any loss of them, or, but I wouldn't want to do it again. Mm -hmm. once <laughs> <laughs> so you learned to appreciate life more? Oh, yeah, sure. Yeah, sure did. And uh, I was the forward to reunions. I guess is, is there anything that we haven't talked about that, you know, you, as you sort of anticipated uh, this interview, things that kind of pop out at you? That, uh, no, not really. I, I, I felt that uh, because I was so lucky that, uh, and I'm able to, and I like to keep busy because I think that's what sort of keeps you, keeps you young. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> I, I volunteer here at the VA a lot. Mm -hmm. I volunteer about three times a week. On Mondays I, I, I volunteer uh, driving for the fleet uh, maintenance service, getting cars uh, uh, washed and uh, serviced and whatnot. Mm -hmm. So I got, and then I, I uh, volunteered at the stamp club. I just sort of got indirectly involved with that. <laughs> you sound like a volunteering kind of guy. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and then, uh, and then on, on mostly Fridays and, and, and Saturdays and sometimes Sundays, I volunteer as a driver for the blind rehab center, driving patients here and there for uh, breakfast, for lunch, for dinners. And uh, if, if you had, you have grandkids. Do I have grandkids? I have one mm -hmm. uh, adopted from China. My daughter wasn't able to have, have children, so they adopted a, a boy from China. Does, does he ever ask about your experience? Or is it, is no, that? not really. Well, he, he lives in Tennessee, Chattanooga. Yeah. And once in a while, I'll talk about my experience, but he, he's never really curious. curious about yeah. <clears throat> what, 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 what's your observation on, you know, sort of, you know, the current generation in terms of you know, the, what, what you did, the willingness to sacrifice and to uh, do something on behalf of the country and stuff. Do you, do you I, still see that? Uh, in, in I, don't, I don't think I do, no. I don't see the patriotism there that we, we used to have as, you know, mm -hmm. when we were young kids. Certainly, like, of course, of course uh, we read all about World War II and all, you know, and a lot of their, our family members and friends who were serving in World War II. That was the thing to do back then. Yeah, serving military. 
that was the value that uh, yeah. that they passed on to right. the rest of us. And yeah, now it's like uh, they have it too easy now in the military. Mm -hmm. uh, oh, in, even in the military. Well, I mean, they don't realize how how soft life is for them in the military. That compared to what we used to have to do. It's like, uh, uh, I don't know, I had a lot to explain. It's, uh, they, uh, things come a lot easier for them. Oh, except when they're in combat, you know, that's different. Uh, everything else, uh, the military life. I, I watch like every time I go Davis Month in there. I watch all these young young airmen, and they they've got they've got it made, you know. Of course, until they go into combat, and that's different. Than, but, uh, yeah, everything else is, becomes so easy for them. Yeah. Well, we're fighting a war, it seems like, at a distance sometimes with yeah. drones and things yeah, right. and such as that. So it's taken on a whole different character. And it's like a, they go serve, say, maybe a year somewhere, and they come back like here. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> they, they come back, and there's a, everybody will welcome them home like heroes, you know. And when we came home, there was nobody there welcomes home like heroes, you know. Green veterans never got that. Yeah, did they? no. no. Why do you so, think that was? I, I don't know. It's just the change in, in the way people people uh, people live. I guess it's uh, well, like after World War II, you had all the returning veterans, yeah, and right, the parades sure, and, yeah, right. and everything, and uh -huh. people, you know, tired of war. Maybe they were just tired. Of, that you know, could be, yeah, right. But it, it's it's just different, which I guess you, you'd expect after so many years. You know, things aren't forever. Mm -hmm. Things change, ideas change, views change. So, well, Vietnam veterans kind of had the same reception you did. Oh yeah, you know, yeah, and stuff. But now it seems to be turning a corner and. Uh, we used to think uh, when the first when the Vietnam veterans start returning and all that, I guess a lot of them had to do with uh, a lot of them were addicts. I think you know the Vietnam veterans addicted to marijuana or whatever, and uh, we used to when when they first started coming back. And we used to hear about the Vietnam veterans and stuff like that. And they're nothing but a bunch of crybabies. <laughs> that, that was our, that was our <laughs> yeah. 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 But you know, not not later on. I, it isn't like that. I, I don't think like that anymore. What, what a veteran's a veteran. You know, he served, and no matter what conditions he served under, and he's still a veteran. Mm -hmm. He served his time, so you treat him like a veteran. There you go. All right. Well said. Is you know, any, our yeah. views and ideas change as time goes by. Mm -hmm. Well, veterans, you know, that suffer trauma, yeah. you know, all right. need yeah. help. And, mm -hmm. yeah. Very good. Anything else that we had not I think we covered everything pretty well. Okay. Well, Harold, I want to thank you for your service. Well, thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, it's it's been a while. It took a while for the Korean veterans to to get that recognition and that honor. And uh, right. I, I hope now you at least feel the appreciation. So, thank you. You're welcome. Thank you.